Thank you all for watching our presentation. The title of our presentation is River Walks, Reef Dives, and Rapid Word Collection Workshops, Related and Supportive Methods to Document Linguistic and Environmental Knowledge. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am recording this presentation from the unceded ancestral territory of the Silks Okanagan people and thank the Hawaiian peoples for being our virtual host for this conference. My name is Christine Schreier and I am a linguistic anthropologist at UBC's Okanagan campus. And this paper was co-authored by my colleagues, Ken Longenecker, a marine biologist from Bishop Museum located in Hon Honolulu, and John Wagner, an environmental anthropologist also at UBC's Okanagan campus. Along the coast of the Morabe province of Papua New Guinea are six Kala speaking villages. Manindila, Lambu, Apose, Kamiali, Adaso, and Kui. And villagers' lives are intertwined with oceans and rivers for survival and as part of their identity. For example, Kala speakers rely on marine fish as a staple of their diet. The Kala orthography includes the tilde or wave symbol to mark nasal vowels, as talking about waves is common for members of Kala speaking communities. Who travel from village to village along the shoreline in outrigger canoes. Rivers and riparian habitat are also fundamental to Kala lifeways. Since most food gardens are planted near rivers in secondary forest areas where wild foods are also harvested. As well, village settlement patterns have historically been based on close proximity to rivers as a source of fresh water. Our research project, Documenting Language Ecology and the Aquatic Environment in Kala, an Endangered Oceanic Language, took us to the three southern speaking Kala villages in 2017. All of these villages share a dialect. And then the three northern speaking villages, which each have their own dialect in 2019. As our project was highly interdisciplinary, including scholars of anthropology, biology, and linguistics, multiple methods to capture multiple types of knowledge were essential to achieving our project's goals, which include an environmental encyclopedia, an extended dictionary, a pedagogical grammar, and an exhibition at the Bishop Museum in Hawaii. Therefore, we utilized three related and supportive documentation methods, river walks, reef dives, and rapid word collection workshops, which you can see pictured here. Our larger Kala language documentation project was supported by the Kala language committee, three individuals from each Kala speaking village, usually two men and one woman, as well as Kala community researchers, individuals who had been trained in the use of the Kala orthography and in language elicitation work. Our arrival in each village followed a typical pattern we would meet with the wider community where the Kala members of our research team helped explain activities that made up our language documentation methods. On the first day, our two scuba divers, Ken Longenecker, my co-author for this paper and the PI of our grant, and David Lacco, a graduate student in linguistic anthropology, would immediately hire a boat to take them out to a local reef. The purpose of their dives was to capture video footage of the marine environment, including, including reef formations, fish, and coral. The following day, we would meet with knowledge experts in each village to review the footage in order to document Kala names for the items captured on the video, as well as collecting any stories about being out on the ocean. <clears throat> the Kala community researchers would assist us, translating the Kala replies into Tokbisin, and then eventually transcribing these replies. Our setup for the marine interviews was elaborate, as you can see here. As the experts needed to be able to view the videos clearly, and we needed to be able to record them as well. 
with video cameras and audio recorders, which you can see in the photo. At the last ICLDC in 2019, oh, sorry, Ken and David presented on some of the technological challenges that we ran into in this work, including the poor eyesight of the knowledge experts, the challenge with providing a big enough screen for the experts to view the video, which is why we have the larger screen here, uh, a pullout screen rather than a computer, and a dark enough space. As well, we had issues syncing the audio and video of our recordings, and I will discuss how we resolved these issues after I discuss the rest of the methods. As a side note, we almost always had a delicious seafood dinner following our marine interviews, as something about being able to view the video of the reefs made community members excited to go out fishing on the reefs. We also spent time in each village documenting the riparian environment through the method we call river walks. As Ken was in charge of reef dives, John Wagner, pictured in the middle here, my co-author for this paper and co-I on this grant, was in charge of the river walks. As I mentioned earlier, John is an environmental anthropologist who has focused on rivers as social systems in Oceania, as well as in North America. For the river walks, we would work with our community researchers and Kala Language Committee members to locate first a river that would be suitable to travel on, either along the shore or actually in the river if it was shallow enough to walk in, and second, community knowledge experts who could tell us about the history of the area as well as the plants and animals that are harvested there. Then John, Ken, the community researchers and the knowledge experts, and occasionally other members of our team would set off for the mouth of the river to walk upriver. This could be slow going due to muddy terrain or jungle plants impeding the route. When individuals wanted to share information, John would record the audio while Ken recorded video clips of the items being indicated, whether that was a plant or a fish, etc. As in the marine interviews, the knowledge expert would describe the item in Kala, and then one of the community researchers would translate for us into Tokpisin, eventually transcribing both the Kala and the Tokpisin. In the 2017 river walks, we also had challenges with technology, in particular, the syncing of audio and video files. However, river walks also caused merriment in the village as the individuals from the group who were going on the walk <clears throat> were also get, often given the opportunity to wear gum boots, also known as Wellington boots or rubber boots in Canada, which were purchased for the project. And this was a novelty to many people, although returning individuals were often carrying the boots rather than wearing them, as they were not used to walking in them, as they usually go barefoot or in sandals. Following each river walk, the boots would be turned over on sticks to dry, making impromptu boot art exhibits, or so we joked. Here's some in some of the villages and another. Another of our days in the villages, we organized a rapid word collection workshop. Our version of the workshop is a modified one developed by SIL. As we held the workshops for just one day and only focused on words related to the semantic categories of ocean and river, ta and are in Kala respectively. The workshops were led by myself, a linguistic anthropologist and co-I for this grant. And at the start of each one, I would explain how in the past when I had come to interview language speakers, during the time we were working on developing the orthography with the community in 2010, I had sat down with only one man and one woman in each village. And so words would come malome malome, or very slowly in Kala. But in the workshop, we would be documenting words in a group. So we could document words sebe sebe, or very quickly in Kala. The Kala phrase for the rapid word collection in the southern dialect of Kala is tagabi sebe sebe, to collect words quickly, quickly. After I had explained the process, I would split the main group of approximately 30 adult individuals of all ages into two or three subgroups, depending on how many of our research team was with us. And then a community researcher would go with each subgroup as would a member of the North American team. The team member would rec audio record subgroup discussions in Kala about the semantic category I had provided to them, such as the category of ocean waves, but also would help prompt them. The community researcher would write down all of the subgroup's suggestions. 
The subgroups were given 10 minutes for each category and then would return to the main group where the community researchers would write their lists on the blackboard. Then a group member would pronounce each word and provide a top in translation. Discussions would also sometimes occur on whether a word was spelled correctly. The Calla orthography was only seven or nine years old, depending on which year we visited each village, and is still not widely used, which can cause some confusion. Individuals would also discuss the meaning of the words themselves, as well as any additional words that weren't captured in the first 10 minutes of subgroup brainstorming. When everyone had agreed they had reached the end of that category, um, the end of that category, we would move on to the next semantic category. Interestingly, the inclusion of the two environments, river and marine, provided us with interesting comparisons between the semantic categories of words in English versus Kala and enabled us to document how Kala speakers view the world. For example, anemones are called lumoin in Kala, which translates in Tokpisin as mushroom belongs salt water or ocean mushroom. While the clownfish that lives in the anemone, which is pictured here, is known as E. Lumois, the fish of the anemone, which illustrated that Kala speakers understand the relationship between the two species. Finally, a fun side note about the rapid word collection workshops was that each village was competitive with each other. And when I started telling each new village how many words the previous village had collected in their workshops, usually about 220 words, they would try to break the record. So the final group, Apose, had a total of 256 words in their workshop, workshop, much to the amusement of all involved. As I have explained above, we realized after our first field season in 2017 that our recording methods for each of our methods was inefficient, as was the transcription process. The Cala community researchers, um, pictured here, some of them in each village were responsible for transcribing both the Kala language content as well as the talk piece in translations for us so that we could include this material in our project outputs, particularly the environmental encyclopedia. And you just saw a picture of that with even more. During the 2017 field season, we audio recorded all interviews and workshops in their entirety. We also video recorded workshops and marine interviews in their entirety, whereas short video clips were recorded for the river walks. This was because the river walks included long periods of walking near rivers where there was no language content and short periods of Kala speakers discussing some aspect of the riparian environment, dense language content. This approach was inefficient because audio recordings of marine and freshwater interviews included long periods of silence interspersed with shorter periods of Kala content mixed with talk in discussion. The Kala content was often highly repetitive because speakers had not prepared their statements. This led community researchers to produce transcriptions of limited and often repetitive Kala content. Community researchers then used their transcriptions of somewhat disorganized and multilingual audio content to produce translations. It took community researchers several months to produce transcriptions and translations, which then had to be gathered from the three southern villages and transported to an urban center to be scanned and sent to the North American research team. An additional difficulty was that it was difficult for the North American team to match transcriptions to the translations as they were not always clearly marked. For the Riverwalk interview, synchronizing short video clips with the long audio files was difficult because there were no start cues at the beginning of each unit of spoken Kala. It was difficult and time consuming to synchronize the waveforms of the high quality audio files with the low quality audio recorded with the video files. At the end of our 2017 field season, all high quality, quality audio and synchronized audio video files contained long segments with no Kala content. This produced unnecessarily large file sizes which were then archived. So what did we do? During our second field season in 2019, and this picture is from that year, we addressed the above problems by recording only focused Kala content and employing a digital clapperboard. For interview or workshop audio, we recorded a single audio file with pauses between content of interest. This allowed us to condense several hour long interviews or workshops into tens of minutes of content. 
For video, we produced a single short clip for each segment of interest. We began each session by configuring the electronic clapperboard. The activity was entered, such as Apose Marine interview, or in this case, Menindola River Walk, and the scene count was reset to one. The count in option was selected in the application settings, which made the clapperboard produce a series of three simultaneous audible beeps and visible flashes of light, followed by an animation of closing clapperboard and a loud clap sound when the clapperboard closed. I will show you a video of this in the next slide. As well, during the interview or workshop, knowledge experts were asked to prepare their statements prior to recording. Each time a knowledge expert was ready to speak, we advanced the scene counter on the electronic clapperboard, resumed recording on the previously paused audio recorder. We then began video recording, announcing the scene number so it could be heard on the audio and video recorders. Then we activated the electronic clapperboard while it was in the field of view of the video recorder and positioned it so that its sound would be heard on the audio recorder. After the synchronizing cue, the clap, we signaled for the knowledge expert to begin speaking. The knowledge expert finished speaking, and then they would say, then I may, in Kala, meaning that's all. And we stopped the video recorder and paused the audio recorder again until the next segment. So here's a video of that now. Scene 11. Okay. My dandy, I pony. No song with a marunku kumamanu, Bianti alami, Bonga tela, the Magasadi, Mamupiagi, the Mapipan to Miss Ungamengi, the Ungamengi Maswan, Danam. At the end of an interviewer workshop, we had produced a series of video clips, one for each scene, and a single audio file with each scene announced before a knowledge expert began speaking. For each scene, the audio recording bracketed the video clip, so the audio started before and ended after the video content. Community researchers then transcribed and translated the audio files, now without long periods of silence, including an audible identifier for each spoken sequence, the scene number, and only Kala content of interest. The efficiency of this new approach resulted in all transcriptions and translations being completed while we were still in the Kala villages. This reduced the travel burden on our community researchers and greatly accelerated the pace of our work. All transcriptions and translations were typed in a word processing program before we returned to North America whereas we had to wait several months to begin the typing process following our previous field season in 2017. The new approach with scene numbers identifying each transcription and translation also allowed the North American research team to confidently match transcribed and translated text. Also, because the Kala language experts were taking time to plan their responses, the quality of the language documentation is higher than in the often repetitive segments we collected in 2017. Although this did limit the collection of natural speech, we were able to record more natural speech in free form storytelling recorded at the end of each semi-structured interview, in language field notes, and in the story collection compiled by linguistics PhD student, Margaret Ransdell Green in Port Moresby with two diasporic Kala speakers. The modified methods also eased the task of synchronizing video footage with high quality audio recordings. The final clap, a spike on the waveform, was easily matched to the point at where the clappers closed on the video. All video files were synchronized to high quality audio while still in the field, whereas the same task using our original methods took several weeks after we had returned home in 2017 to complete. The new approach, which eliminated long periods of silence and corresponding black screens on synchronized video and extraneous spoken contact, also greatly reduced electronic media storage requirements. In sum, we believe that this example of multiple interdisciplinary methods builds on the growing body of literature about the importance of collaborative, community engaged, transparent and interdisciplinary methods in language documentation. Combined, these methods and the adaptations we made 
allowed for the collection and archiving of more linguistic and more ecological knowledge with richer content and smaller archival file storage requirements. In closing, I'd like to thank you all for listening to our presentation today and acknowledge these individuals, Te Anda Ndibara Gorotome, as well as our funders. I look forward to any questions or comments you might have in our question and answer period of the conference. Thank you.